What we're going to do now is I'm going to give you a quick overview of Java synchronizers. So we've talked a little bit about threads. We will cover threads in more detail later, uh, and you'll get to understand them in all their full-blown glory. But right now, I'm going to talk about Java synchronizers. And this is a nice segue into the part B of the programming assignment. So there's a whole pile of synchronizers in Java. We have so-called atomic actions that take place or not atomically. We have mutual exclusion that allows you to be able to serialize access to some shared resource. We have a whole pile of coordination mechanisms that allow you to be able to ensure that computations run in the right order at the right time, in the right conditions. And there's also something called barrier synchronization that waits until everybody's in a certain state. They're all in a certain state before they can start to run, kind of a gang scheduling-like manner. So remember we talked about shared objects earlier, and I talked about how one of the goals of concurrency was to be able to um, coordinate or, or interact between shared objects? So that's what a synchronizer does. It's basically an object that controls the flow of, that controls the flow of control of cooperating threads based on the state of the synchronizer. And synchronizers in Java are used to ensure that threads obey certain properties. So here are some of the properties that they obey. One of the key ones is don't corrupt shared mutable data, right? And that's if you don't obey that property, you'll end up with race conditions, as we've talked about before. Another thing that they can be used to ensure are that the threads will execute or run in the right order at the right time and or under the right conditions. Those are all somewhat different. We'll talk about that. We use synchronizers to address certain inherent complexities of concurrency. There's different kinds of complexity. There's accidental complexity, which typically works when we, or typically arises when we use low-level tools or methods or languages that get you in trouble because they don't have the right type safety or type checking and so on. Inherent complexities are just fundamental to the domain. It's part of the rocket science of software development. They're, they're hard issues. So one of them is atomic ordering, which is important when you want to ensure an action either happens or doesn't. So it's like the transporter beam, or uh, it's like Harry Potter uh, disapparating. And what happens with uh, atomic ordering is that you need to make sure that operations on fields in one thread occur all at once with respect to operations on the same field from a different thread. And here's sort of the, the classic example. I've got a, I've got a variable, like a, a loop counter, and I want to be able to increase it or decrease it by, by one. And I have two threads. And if I'm not careful, what happens is that one thread will come in, uh, read the value of the variable. Let's say it starts with zero. Increase it by one and write it back. But um, the value, so the value will now be one. This guy will come along. He reads the value of this thing, increases by one, and then it writes back to so the values too. So this is a sequential ordering, and that gives us the right result, right? That's, that's what we want. However, you won't get that right behavior if you don't use synchronization primitives properly in Java. You'll get other kinds of behaviors. And we'll talk more about the different kinds of problems you can get. You can have read-write conflicts and read-read uh, conflicts and all kinds of conflicts that occur when you have the ordering of these operations occur in, in unexpected ways. And unexpected means because the hardware is doing stuff behind your back that you're not aware of, but will cause you trouble. In Java, this atomic ordering capability is provided by various things, uh, not the least of which is the Java Atomic package. And you will get a chance to play with Java Atomics for assignment 1b. You'll get a chance to play around with uh, either atomic Boolean or, or uh, atomic references. Another kind of mechanism are called mutual exclusion. There's a whole pile of these in Java, and they prevent simultaneous access to a shared resource within a critical section. So the classic human uh, known use case of this would be a restroom in an airplane, which has two states, either occupied or vacant. And the model is that it's a critical section, so if it's occupied, then you can't get in there until someone leaves and it becomes vacant. So it's sort of you know, one at a time access to the critical resource. If you don't follow those rules, then crazy stuff happens and you end up with race conditions. And that occurs because the state is changed. Here's a simple example of this with so-called read-write conflicts. So this is the same example we did before. 
we have two threads. This thread increases a field that starts with zero by one, and it writes it back at the same time that thread two will read from it. And the question is, does thread two see the value zero? Does it see the value one? Does it see something in between, right? Some random gobbledygook? Hard to say, right? And if you don't have proper mutual exclusion, then you can end up with non-deterministic results, which invariably will be incorrect if you count on those things being appropriate in your program. And so we talk about there being a conflict if at least one write is occurring while something else may be reading the same thing. There's also write-write conflicts. So this occurs if two threads try to write to the same field concurrency concurrently, then the result may be inconsistent. So here we have two threads. The first thread tries to, that both threads start up, they both read the value of zero. Thread one increases the value by two. Thread two increases the value by one. And then they both write back at the same time. And the question is, is the value one? Is it two? Is it some other random value? Hard to say, right? That's a write-write conflict. And this type of problem may seem somewhat academic, but it's really a big deal these days in modern multi-core processors, which have so-called weak memory ordering semantics. You can read more about that here. And the reason why they have weak memory order semantics is that you have all these caches taking place at the core level in order to try to speed things up. And the order in which things are then written back to main memory, which is kind of ground truth in these models, are not going to be uh, controlled properly unless you use the proper mutual exclusion mechanisms. Because otherwise, the caches will get too smart for their own good, and they'll allow out-of-order load and store operations. So you'll end up with inconsistent writes. So if somebody's trying to read or write to a non-volatile memory uh, location or non-volatile variable, then it's really not clear what the values will be, because you don't know when the value will be pushed from the cache up to main memory, and you don't know when another cache will read that value. So there are various kinds of things called memory fences, we'll talk more about those later, that are used to push the caches and synchronize the values in the caches. And mutual exclusion mechanisms are crucial to doing that. Mutual exclusion is supported in Java by a whole pile of locking primitives, rantrant lock, rantrant read-write lock, stamp lock, and so on. You'll get lots of experience playing around with these things. The next mechanism is coordination. And this ensures that the computations run properly with respect to the ordering. So let's say you want to write a, a ping pong program, right? The, like the old Pong video game. And you want to take turns. One thing pings, and then the other thing pongs. And one thing, you know, so that basically you're going back and forth like playing ping pong. Uh, in order to enforce the right order, you need to use a synchronizer, such as a semaphore. Getting things to run at the right time, that's really about more real-time computing. We're not going to talk much about that, but that's another form of coordination. And then getting things to run under the right conditions is also important. So for your Palantir application that you're doing throughout the class, you want to make sure that we have these invariants, that you don't allow more gazers, more beings to gaze, than there are Palantir to gaze into. So that means you can't run until you get yourself a resource, like a Palantir. Coordination is supported in Java by various things. We've got condition objects, semaphores, monitor, monitor objects, monitor locks, so on and so forth. So there's lots of different things that Java supports there. And then the fourth and final type of synchronization mechanism is barrier synchronization. And that ensures that threads, which are oddly called parties in Java, that parties have to all stop at a certain point and they can't proceed until everybody's ready to go. So a good example of that might be a horse race where you make everybody wait at the gate before they start running. Oh, by the way, the coordination metaphor was passing a baton in a race, right? So you have to wait. You can't start running until someone hands the baton to you. There's a whole pile of barrier synchronizers in the Java concurrent package, such as countdown latches, cyclic barriers, phasers. And you've got a chance to play around with most of those in the class as well. OK, so that is basically the end of that discussion.